Thank you very much for being with us today and uh, happy we can get started. Good. Thank you very much. Well, you know, welcome to everyone who's tuned in. Uh, I thank you for making the time to uh, to do with this. And I thank the Air Circuits for hosting and setting this up. Um, this is, you know, part of my HDI training both design and fabrication and reliability. Um, as you'll see, this is my 42nd year working with high density interconnect HDI. Um, and so it's really, really an old topic for me, but I guess many of you maybe are just starting into it. IPC recently done a survey indicating um, there's an increasing planning of everyone 2024 to move into HDI. Uh, for some of you that are been in HDI a while, you're probably moving into what we call ultra HDI. So we're going to address these. Um, the first thing is I want to differentiate what HDI is. And, um, and because when we talk about HDI, different people will maybe talking about different kinds of HDI, which changes process materials and a whole lot of other factors. Um, this is mainly talking about design, but when you get into HDI, design is closely linked to fabrication. And so um, these are some of the quality issues to watch for in a, an HDI that's going to affect your um, your actual design. And then uh, some of the progress made in uh, HDI manufacturing that affects the design. And like I said, the the first micro VS that HP invented 1982, um, which was not HDI. Uh, and I'll show you that later. And some of the most advanced HDI, how people got there, the next generation, and then performance and reliability benchmarking, and then an appendix where we, you know, uh, give a, my history, statistical tool and test vehicles and other um, pictures that we don't have time for today. The first thing is I want to differentiate HDI. HDI really comes in three platforms, uh, miniaturizations um, like the iPhone, things like that. Um, and then packaging technology, flip chip, wire bonding, uh, um, and then really high performance that you, you see in uh, high performance computers and in telecom, which are totally different than the HDI used in say the iPhone or in packaging. And so, when people say HDI, one of the problems is you, you, you need to kind of benchmark them and place them. What HDI are they talking about? Are they talking about the same HDI that you're doing? Or are they talking about packaging? Or are they talking about portable uh, miniaturized products? Or are they talking about very large, hot, high-speed, high-performance products? Because the HDI is different than all three of these. Um, and uh, and you don't want to pay too much attention to what they're talking if they're they're not talking about your platform because they're not giving you the best information necessarily um, for what you want to work with. Um, but what what all HDI typically has in common is the use of micro vias or you know typically very very small blind vias uh, produced today mainly through laser, but in the early days, um, we had about six different ways of making micro vias. Um, and, and when you're dealing with laser, laser drilling is a lot more complex than mechanical drilling of through holes are. Um, so one of the things that we developed and evolved used is this seven uh, item uh, check on the quality of laser drilling. And, and that's because uh, it's, you 
you can't set up the uh, the drilling parameters like you would for FR4 or uh, normal through-hole boards. Um, every customer kind of has a unique stack up, a new, unique selection of materials and um, unique thicknesses. Um, and because of that, uh, you know, you, you have to do test runs and optimization of the stack up and the design rules that a particular customer has selected. <clears throat> and then you have to cross section and look at your blind vias in these seven areas. <coughs> and I, I show kind of the specs of A, B, and C, uh, what you measure and what the control limits are and kind of the sample size, and things like that. Uh, because <coughs> it's, um, these things are so small that you, they really can't use optical inspection <clears throat> to get to what they look like. Uh, you need to have <clears throat> worked with the, the fabricator closely to understand that they have optimized your particular stack of material selection and design rules. Um, um, and then also, like I said, um, one of the beauties with laser is that with optical, um, you can use and design the fiducials to get extremely tight tolerances all the way down to zero annular rates, what we call a landless. Uh, um, it's possible, like I said, with the laser and the camera to, uh, to have a pad size, exact diameter of the laser, the finished laser drilled hole. Consequently, um, strangely enough, it's more reliable than if you had a pad on it. Um, and I, I won't go into the, um, the physics of how that is, but it's in the print circuit handbook if you read the chapter 60 on uh, HDI reliability. Um, now, like I said, in our laser machines, uh, we calibrate these virtually each week. Of course, unfortunately, you know, Hewlett Packard making the, the laser measuring machines that people that use, we don't sell them. We have an agency, um, another company sell the coordinate measuring equipment laser, but we manufacture all of them, developed it. Um, and one of the big problems is the use of, of fiberglass. Fiberglass slows laser drilling and it can cause a lot of plating defects um, that you don't necessarily have with mechanical. And it can make the vias very difficult to fill with them. Um, here's some pictures of, like there on the right here. Um, and if your uh, fabricator is using a CO2 laser, uh, like I said, with the CO2 laser, you have energy that you have to specify. You have to specify pulse length. You have to specify rep rate. Um, um, and you have to specify programming location. So um, if that's not done consciously, um, then you can essentially delaminate the, uh, the subject layer um, below that. Uh, but you don't know you've delaminated it because it, it's not a surface. This is you know, the target land on that. So um, uh, laser drilling is a, a really refined art that um, is specific for each customer and how each customer has been designing because there's no standard method of designing HDI out there and there's no standard set of materials. There are everything. Um, so laser via plating and desmearing after the, the are important because uh, there is a re residue smear uh, that has to be removed as shown here. Um, and typically one of the ways we double check for that is with a coupon in the lower right there. Um, actually at the desmear line, checking the uh, resistance of a uh, daisy chain on the panel head. And so uh, depending on the desmear, uh, 
you can use typically for manganate treatment or modified systems or plasma treatment. Um, most people don't use the RCC, uh, but um, as you get down in geometry, the uh, weave of the glass fill um, inhibits the ability to do ultrafine line uh, HDI. And so people are moving back to different types of RCC. Um, there's a new one with a polyimid layer under the copper, um, a cured polyimid layer. And there's another one with a reinforced laminate, but the, the, the finest view of spread glass available that they actually don't uh, um, sell as a prepreg, but can be used with an RCC. And so these smear conditions are important uh, from after laser, removing the residual smear, and then after D smear, and then checking and clearing that, that these, there are, is no uh, residual smear. Um, typically, sweller permanganate and then a neutralizer afterwards. Um, the difficulty then moves into metallization because it's difficult in getting fluids into a small blind via. Um, and uh, depending on the uh, design rules selected uh, and everything else, you know, that has to be done uh, extremely cautiously and again with methods of checking that in, in fact, metallization has been done completely and, and thoroughly. Um, so the plating process uh, after imaging and metallization um, again, we'll talk about that later. Uh, it's difficult because these vias are so small, um, they don't lend themselves in copper plating to air agitation uh, because it's easy for the surface tension to trap small air bubbles in the blind via. These aren't through holes. Um, and it's difficult to get that air bubble out of that, which will inhibit the plating and create other problems. Um, so one of the things I always emphasize is a plating check, typically uh, uh, two coupons per panel and five panels per lot being checked uh, that you clip off right at the plating line and then take these things and uh, drop them into a, a solder pot, 288 degrees Celsius solder pot for 10 seconds, typically four to six immersions, and then an inspection with a microscope to make sure that uh, the, uh, the plating has not separated. But there can be other blind via plating problems because of the chemistry. And, uh, and you can see that excessive dog boning you know, or, or uh, metallization with electric copper that um, that failed to uh, uh, to materialize, uh, and then uh, and then just the diameter alone. Um, larger diameters like eight mils, uh, and with a lower aspect ratio, as that aspect ratio drops, the difficulty of of getting thorough plating um, and uniform distribution of plating becomes tougher and tougher, as we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, these are other typical uh, uh, problems that, that you can see, but you can also see the magnification. So uh, this is not the kind of thing that you're going to know where to look uh, for uh, if you have any kind of incoming inspection uh, in assembly. Um, so we'll talk about that um, a little in. And so like I say, the subjects have a lot to do with it. And that's because there's no such thing as a standard FR4. FR4s have all kinds of fillers in them, uh, different types of cloth, uh, spread glass, 
um, different coatings on the glass, uh, different fillers um, to affect their CTE and things like that. And so um, every customer's stack up and design will need to be tested for those seven quality indicators um, I showed you on the first slide, um, and then optimize for that the recipe that will go into actually making the HDI boards. Um, and any changes in design rules, you need to contact, make your fabricator aware of that because that may affect uh, a, a lot of different recipes they've got. Um, and uh, if you've made a change, they don't know about it, then they may be using the wrong recipe. Um, and there's you know also things like corner voids uh, that can affect you. So these are just randomly kind of good microvias. Uh, don't recommend the one in the middle uh, uh, microvia on top of the stack via unless um, the fabricator has demonstrated that um, they've gotten past the known reliability issues with this. You you can do this, but it um, is tricky. Um, and then there on the right, skip the, uh, um, where we go down uh, a couple of layers and I'll show you a technology that allows us now to go down five layers on a blind via, um, which really, really uh, makes design much cheaper and simpler on HDI. Uh, but these are all uh, fairly good examples of uh, good micro vias desmeared, metallized, and plated. A uh, little kind of a close-up of that. Uh, uh, a good plating. So filling microvias uh, can solve assembly problems and is required for if you need doing stack microvia structures. Um, and there's a, a number of different methods of filling the epoxy electros and plating or conductive epoxy and plating or um, um, an all plating method or as kind of a superfill, um, I would really like to call it. Um, you know, these are different examples of filled microvias, uh, uh, non conductive resin fill with the right CTE and then capped and overplated. Um, stack microvias, but also uh, uh, a superfilled type of microvia. And the superfilled mechanism came in about 20 years ago. Uh, but it's kind of the most complex of all types of copper plating because the ratio of brighteners, levels, and carriers uh, had to be tightly controlled in order for this super fill mechanism to actually fill up uh, a through hole or ply bill with a solid uh, copper plating. And uh, any kind of variations in the additive uh, results in, uh, in different kinds of plating that may or may not be suitable for the assembly process as seen here. Uh, so, you know, we'll talk about the uh, the requirements in controlling uh, plating, and especially as the diameter of the microvia is, gets smaller and smaller. Um, because failed superplating looks like this, and that will pass all of your electrical tests, but that's going to fail. Um, uh, not only that, but you can see that it there's probably um, excessive energy used in uh, making this microvia because it actually took away some of the copper on the target lab down there. Um, you know, the registration was okay. It's in the middle of the target lab, but um, this is not uh, um, this is not going to be a reliable via, but it is going to pass optical and visual and electrical tests. Whereas, you know, a good superfill will look like this. And uh, uh, there's not a, a crack there at the bottom. That's just uh, 
the cross section and the fact that the electric uh, copper is a is a darker than the the copper on the uh, the other ones, or it, it could be a direct metallization and no electric copper at all. I'm not sure. Uh, like I said, this stuff being 20 to 30 years old, I've forgotten exactly <laughs> which. If I made this or somebody gave that to me. Um, when it gets to this superfill chemistry, uh, I illustrated this to show that, well, um, you know, what kind of equipment do you have? You have vertical or conveyorized plating? Um, you, you, are you doing panel plating or pattern plating or button plating? Um, do you also want the superfill to fill the through holes? Um, and so there's a lot of different chemistries out there. Um, the vendors of these typically are McDermott, uh, DuPont Dow, Technique, Aditech, Wimura, and Skycam and others in China. Um, if you have been successfully doing um, HDI superfill and are looking into moving into the ultra HDI, that's going to need improved agitation probably pulse plating, uh, use of insoluble anodes. And those insoluble animals are typically segmented anodes with automatic chemical analysis and go dosing ultrafiltration and typically either horizontal or vertical conveyor systems or hoist systems um, and working with new materials. Um, so your state-of-the-art plants like the new green source uh, facility in New Hampshire have as many as seven different plating solutions and the unique ability to exchange a plating solution in a, a less than five minutes. So uh, you know, uh, they have different plating, not necessarily seven different plating equipment, but um, they do have many different kinds of plating equipment, but they can move the material the chemistry in and out uh, very, very rapidly depending on um, oh, the type of board is being manufactured and coming through there. Um, and then you also have to worry in HDI about final finish, uh, things like ENIG and its uh, background plating uh, in, in which, because of the higher density, you get uh, high resistance shorts. Um, and problems with fine line etching, um, as you can see here in the upper left. Uh, uh, and as well as, uh, because we're talking about miniaturization and the vias being closer together, um, the reinforcement cautions about the pathway for filament growth between adjacent via holes. Uh, is a concern in one that uh, that tests and other types of uh, measurement needs to be produced um, to make sure that the stack up and the design rules uh, are suitable for whatever the, the the calf requirements are for automotive now the uh, the number of hours um, is much much higher than was traditional uh, so that's an, a growing concern, as well as uh, solder mass misregistration, um, because the solder mass curing uh, and techniques like that, um, if you've got filled buried vias, you know, might cause a cracking in, in those, um, especially um, if you're using a lead free hot air solder leveling uh, a process, and because not just the solder mass, but also the the hassle uh, can produce cracks. So a modern copper cell is um, illustrated here, from Alex Stepinski. You know, mm -hmm. the, you can you can read about. He gives some um, HDI design guidelines in the November issue, uh, PCB 07. Um, and what it shows is um, some of the new things, and that's use eductors. Uh, this is an olden bottom eductor. This is more common 
to the modern copper cell detectors uh, in which the solution uh, agitation is provided by uh, larger pumps and by uh, distribution of nozzles that you see here and not the use of air agitation. Uh, this is also common you know, on a vertical conveyorized system where the uh, agitation is important since the conveyor is moving, but also um, air is not utilized in it because the air can be problematic um, with very small blind vias. Um, and the use now of insoluble anodes and segmented anodes as seen here on the lower left um, on the upper right is an anode box with the membrane, uh, the segmented anode on the inside, which is iridium titanium, iridium coated titanium, um, and then the inductors uh, built into it. So, uh, and this is part of a fluid system where you got pump, filter, inductor, and circuit there in those lower right, um, providing a much greater solution agitation than uh, we ever had in through-hole plating. Uh, this will benefit through-hole plating uh, in order to do a higher aspect ratio. And so, like I said, it, it may not be needed for the uh, miniaturized quarter products, but for the large supercomputers and large telecom, where the boards can be thicker, uh, made with low loss materials, and the through-holes have higher aspect ratio, you know, this is all important for reliability of plating of that. Um, auto analysis and dosing. Uh, auto analyzers seen there in the lower left uh, continuously. This happens to be a picture out of the new SEL uh, fabrication facility in Idaho that was in the uh, October and November PCB 07. They did an extensive walkthrough and tour of the new SEL facility, which is probably the, the most recent um, automated uh, print circuit multilayer fabrication line uh, used in North America. Um, and a really, really uh, great job done by everybody with it. Um, as part of that, uh, the work agitation uh, um, on both the vertical conveyorized and the hoist system um, now utilize sealed plating tanks like there on the left where there is no ventilation required um, anymore. And there on the right, uh, this plating system has X, Y, Z and bump work agitation. Um, if you can imagine that. Uh, in order to provide that uh, agitation and solution movement uh, and the freedom of any small uh, bubbles or uh, uh, anything like that being captured in a blind via hole. Now, most of this is determined by test coupons in manufacturing test vehicles. Um, there on the left, is one of the new ones I developed of being in charge of Foxconn there in China. Um, Foxconn is um, five times larger than what the world thought was the, the biggest manufacturer in the world because Foxconn is a captive manufacturer. They, uh, they don't sell boards. They um, use them for the assembly business like the iPhones, things like that. And so uh, uh, a test vehicle there on the right-hand side in the red is a, uh, is a plating one. The one on the left uh, um, handles virtually every aspect of multilayer lamination and plating and etching and metallization, and solder mask and legend, um, as well as IST and IPC decoupons. Um, as, as part of uh, uh, continuously monitoring the manufacturing uh, process control systems. Um, like I said, the 
reliability of the plating, the fastest is easiest is to to have a small set of uh, blind vias set up to be uh, sheared off or taken out of the actual panel um, and then provided a 10 second soccer float and then six cycles of that. Or a more accurate one, like I said, it is uh, to go into a thousand cycles of minus 145 up to 145C after preconditioning for the assembly process. Um, with that, you use a four wire Kelvin resistance system, uh, typically uh, a six digit system of very high accuracy, which are expensive, like here's a Keithley, but could be Tektronics or Agilent, or one that I found uh, a new one called Pico Test made in Taiwan. It's an outstanding copy of the best of Agilent and Tectronics and Keithley. As you can see there, it's a six digit one, but uh, the Agilent and the Tech and Keithley um, start about $2,000, whereas the Pico Test is $600. And the Pico Test also has an optional card um, to handle 40 um, different channels. Um, with the built-in scanner, as well as you can see in the front temperature input. Um, so it's an excellent piece of machinery for $600 to use on the probe. And you can see the uh, um, the uh, test vehicle we're using um, has four different uh, daisy chains, but also has um, IPC D coupons and ISD coupons in the center. Um, it tested for every lot going through. And what we're looking for, you know, in these thermal cycle and thermal shock tests are cracks and uh, crack propagation uh, with it. And we do that because of what people, uh, OEMs begin to notice, especially military, that PC boards that passed all the electrical tests were failing in the field. Um, basically because the laser cracks in the electric copper separating. Um, and they separate during assembly at the lead free assembly temperatures, but then uh, when they cool off, go back together, we'll pass all electrical tests. And so IPC came up with the test method 2.6.27B in which you do the testing, you know, at the assembly, maximum assembly temperatures, but being constantly monitored by a four bar Kelvin system uh, to discover if in fact uh, the crack is, has started propagated or opening up, even though um, it may be really perfectly okay uh, after cooling down uh, from it. So talking about this, how did we develop HDI at, at Hewlett Packard in 1982? Well, we didn't intend to create micro -vias. Um What we had was the world's first 32-bit computer on a single chip called the Focus Chip. It was NMOS 3. Um, and uh, I won't go into how NMOS differs from CMOS, but um, anyway, it's a very, very high speed um, MOS technique, but unfortunately very power hungry. Um, and when we started getting the first chips and mounting them on their processor card, they wouldn't work. And unfortunately, we discovered that uh, we had two problems. The first thing was the use of a 12 mil finished hole and a 62,000 forward. That via, you know, had inductance of 10 nanohenries. Um, and that our NMOS 3 transistors being so small would not drive FR4 with the dielectric uh, dissipation factor of 0.024. Back calculating, we discovered the material had to be made with PTFE Teflon, which uh, 
dielectric dissipation factor of 0 0.002. Uh, we had to have a metal cork because this thing had the heat dissipation of a nuclear reactor and a uh, heat sink and mounted on the top would not provide sufficient cooling. Uh, we had to you technically bond this to a metal core of it and then provide six layers of Teflon over that and then uh, produce a five mil laser drilled blind via four mils deep um, which had an effectiveness of 15 picohens. And then since this is 1982, um, we had to have selected pure gold plating for wire bonding that you see there. Um, so you can actually see through the layers of Teflon um, on this stack up because the Teflon is relatively transparent. And in the upper right, you can see it, um, a daisy chain test um, that every board went through um, being tested at an elevated temperature in the factory. Now in 82, we, we had to build our own ultraviolet laser, but by production volume in 84, we were using these two station UV excimer lasers from JCML in uh, New Hampshire. Um, we had those because those are the UV lasers that we used to drill the three or 400 holes in an HP inkjet cartridge for inkjet printing. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we took advantage of, of already using these very, very accurate excimer lasers, which I doubt anybody else in the world uses on print circuits. Uh, they're, they're quite expensive. Uh, you probably never heard of JCML, and that's because they're six-year backlog of orders, and so there's really no reason for them to advertise. They have lots and lots of business. Um, but the main focus in developing it was by the time 82 had rolled around, we had trained all of the production facilities and everybody into statistical tools and design of experiments and GDQM improvement cycle, the plan, do, check, action methodology for TQM, uh, which is also parroted back in, uh, in the uh, 24 Essential Skills um, ebook that you can download from iConnect 007 uh, uh, free of charge. But um, it talks a lot about problem solving, statistical tools, and DOEs, and TQM and uh, developing new processes. Well, how did Nanya develop HDI? Um, one of the things that we did was HP was recruited uh, to help TSMC uh, in Taiwan uh, develop semiconductor production, uh, but they didn't have the uh, substrates and the multilayers. Um, and that job was given over to Nanya Plastics. Um, and Nanya being the uh, part of Formosa Plastics, which is the world's biggest plastics company. Um, and so I relocated to live in Taiwan and, and recruited and trained 16 engineers, but they knew nothing about printed circuit manufacturing. And so um, they actually worked in the Hewlett Packard facilities for eight months um, to do on the job training and then back to Taiwan where we developed a uh, prototype facility. Um, and one of the things we did was we, um, we developed a parametric PC board um, and used for the training, which had different technologies. So we could build the same board over and over again and measure our performance. Um, we were using it, you see at the bottom, uh, the government supplied statistical handbook. And um, this is something we should look into. You may have, you know, a statistical system at your company, which is fine. But this one you've paid for already by uh, taxes in government through NIST. And it's a world-class statistical handbook, but it also includes the software. And so if you download it, um, what I've done, and encourage everyone else to do 
is use whatever your company requires, but take the data, go back and put it on this one because this statistical system of software you own. And you never know if you get promoted or the opportunity to become a consultant or something, you may not have access to uh, these expensive world class statistics, but you've got this one at home that you've been using all along with examples. Um, and it's an excellent book. You know, don't don't try to print it 2,800 pages. So I don't recommend that you, you print it, but it's created by some of the world's best statisticians in manufacturing. And it gives case studies and examples, and it is designed for a process engineer like us um, in terms of chapter one is, do you think you have a problem? So they're not university oriented in that theory of statistics and things like, you no, know, it's really one of, of practical problem solving and moving through the statistical tools that you need to use or understand. Um, and that's how I discovered it, because I was looking for um, statistical software that would do a Weibull reliability plot and happened to come upon this. Uh, and you have to use the URL I've given you there. If you just go to nist.gov, it's not on their menu. You know, so you can't kind of get to it from their menu, but it's still there. But I do recommend uh, that you download it because uh, I don't know how long it'll be there. I end up, um, and it's really, really excellent. And you may not need it now, but if you download it and store it, you may in the future need the statistical training for engineering statistics. And so, you know, with these test vehicles and tools, you know, you know, this is the process of, of NANYA starting in 1999 to 2004 in the use of uh, reliability and producing three, four, five, six mil microvias with two and four mil annular rings. Um, in 2000, world class is defined in terms of defects per million vehicles, DMV. Um, so less than 50 is world class. 50 defects per million vias. And the resistance, which talks about the metallization, grease smear, and plating of those vias, the resistance coefficient of variance of that resistance should be less than 10%. And so you can see their uh, diameter, annual ring, the covariance, and the defects per million vehicles. Uh, um, starting out in April 1999, the through hole panels and the laser blind via panels, um, you can see the progress. Uh, so by 2004, they were down to 5% covariance, and uh, defects per million vehicles were 5 and 11, 27, depending. Now, like I said, this was 20 years ago. Um, so Remember that uh, most of the competition and the most advanced HDI comes from the Asians. And that's because uh, using techniques like this that we taught them, um, you know, they have rock solid processes with statistical proof, you know, that, you know, their processes are reliable. Um, in terms of an OEM, reliability test. This is one of the things that I did, um, and that's utilizing the uh, uh, conductor analysis technologies coupon. Uh, tested the laminates and the vendors on our uh, through hole uh, techniques from two to eight layers um, with different amounts of assembly preconditioning. Um, and you can see the uh, test panel there um, at the top, we have our solder joint one for assembly. So these panels are ran through our assembly um, with special components inserted on the top one for the reflow to test the solder joint. And then there are five coupons there for the via reliability. And then the cap test at the bottom 
And you can see on the side rails here, different modifications of IPC and other coupons that we're using to correlate the reliability testing of the, the boards themselves with the testing of the coupons. And then these coupons are used on every single product that we have. Um, and it's not symmetrical because the, uh, the minimum width of the conveyor and the other machines are set up um, so they they can't handle these small ones and we don't want to uh, we didn't want to you know a, a double row of things too many uh, test vehicles on the same set um, this actually shows the as used panels before assembly and running it down our our assembly line and that's because we've got here nearly 200 surf automated surface mount assembly lines because we process about 60 million pc boards a year in our facility for the products that the automotive electronic product we put out um, for ultra generation and advanced hdi um, we're starting to move into uh, on pc boards the slp or interposers that utilize the IC substrates uh, geometries, um, like you see in the lower right-hand corner there, uh, moving down to five micron lines and spaces from, uh, you know, 75 micron or three mil lines and spaces with that. Um, but uh, the also thing that's gaining use in Asia is a new three-dimensional technology called the Vertical Conductive Structure, or VCS for short. And VCS um, utilizes, you know, in the drilling operation, the production of a slot. And this slot, uh, the process is in the appendix, is plated and drilled out such that you now have vertical conductive patterns. And because of this, it's very easy to route different depths of the slot and plate them. And so, whereas an HDI board that's stacked, like it has five laminations plating in laser drilling cycles, the VECS uh, has only one lamination and one plating cycle. Or if you have ultra fine pitch, you may have a surface HDI layer where you have uh, two platings and two drilling operations but uh, we want to look into us and the last two years we've done eight or nine um, articles about the uh, ECS uh, because the uh, the reliability and the design capabilities are higher than conventional HDI um, as well as um, less stress on the material um, and easier to fabricate uh, the v vertical conductive structures are kind of totally new and uh, uh, and offer capabilities that you can't duplicate in conventional HDI. So it is a next generation kind of structure. Uh, and a lot of that's proven out by these performance coupons. You have IPCs, PCQR squared, conductor analysis technology, and their portable four wire and the HATS coupon you've seen here in C, D, and E, um, and the HATS text test fixture, which is B, um, and the second generation HATS coupon that the automotive people have standardized on in F, and then the IPC D coupon in G there. Uh, we talked about that, um, as well as IST, and something about the parametric test system coupon that HP developed in 1985. Um, and how this is used in process control, but also to do the capability correspondence. So finally, the uh, uh, so this is we've only spent a quick amount of time, but the references and future reading, like I said, these are all free HDI uh, design process manuals. The HDI handbook from iConnect 07 is 629 pages. Um, Altium has a good one, 46 page one. Sierra Circus has an excellent one, 
the high density interconnect uh, 61 pages that was updated just last year, 2023. Um, if you haven't downloaded, you know, download all three, read them and, and take their advice. With that, I want to thank you for your time and uh, give a short amount of time for you. I guess questions and answers that Lucy will. Yeah, thank you very her. much. Happy, that was a great presentation. Uh, everyone, if you have questions, you can just use the Q&A section and you can ask your questions there. And uh, if you don't have any questions right now, but you might have some later, I will send you the link to our forum where you can just ask and uh, Happy will answer. Yeah, I'll be you know, happy to answer any questions uh, if you send them to Lucy. Um, ah, also, we have one question. We okay. have one right now. Can you see it, Happy? If you click on the Q and A. Well, let me look at it. Okay. Michael Via on Mill Class Three. Can you spec that out. Um, how does one call that out? Well, um, normally. An OEM ordering PC boards, um, uh, you know, they have a manufacturing um, um, kind of overview, which talks about their specification. And so for acceptability, you know, they would you know, call out class three, but they'd also call out this IPC um, test. Um, but you also probably should, you know, call out, you know, how you want to test done like is uh, you know does it need to be done on an IPC D coupon is a PCQR square coupon is it a cat coupon is it an IST coupon uh, but usually there's some uh, paperwork that goes with you know ordering micro via boards um, no, no matter what class they are second what type of VCS is being used mainly in the really, really expensive HDI boards, though so, telecom and supercomputers and medical, um, because those boards are thick. They go through a number of sequential laminations for conventional HDI that stresses the material. Um, the, uh, the, the VECS can do it in one in, or maximum two laminations. Um, with the same kind of stack up, but with uh, much higher reliability because now you're also wiring in the Z, Z direction up and down. Um, like I said, go back the last two years and read the articles, but um, it's really quite a, um, it was invented by one Torme out of the next gen um, in the Netherlands, and invented it, but the Asians, especially in Taiwan, picked it up very rapidly. Um, can you think to the manufacturing process? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, well, um, like I said, in the appendix, I've got a couple of slides, but there are um, um, five articles written by Juan Tomé, who invented the technology, a couple of articles written by Joe Dixon of Wu's, who's perfected it and um, and like I said I would you know one of the best persons to contact is Joe Dixon uh, Wu's, um, if you want prototypes or uh, if you're a fabricator interested in it because they're looking for partners here in North America uh, that put in the ECS process but it's pretty conventional because instead of just drilling you switch to a newly developed bit it's not a router bit, it's not a drill bit, it's a little bit of both. And with that, you do control depth routing um, with your drill or your router. Um, and this route thing allows you to, uh, to wire up to right now 0.4 millimeter pitch BGAs. Um, if you go below 0.4 millimeter, then it's best um, to go to an HDI layer capping the CS layer and laser drilling that. Um, but like I say, one lamination, um, instead of three or four or five or six laminations, 
um, can up to um, six to eight millimeter thick multi-layer boards in telecom. Um, it worries me that the Asians are using this in telecom and in China, Taiwan and Japan and Korea, and we aren't. So we're, we're paying for much more expensive, uh, lower performing boards than they are, simply because we're ignoring the next generation HDI technology, high intensity interconnect. The manufacturing process is outlined, like I say, in the appendix, but it's more detailed in the articles, in the PCB 07 articles. So, the routing, well, interesting enough, the routing of VCS was all done on uh, Altium. Um, but um, I've talked to the mentor and the cadence people, and they have now since Altium had it, uh, kind of put in the VCS for their Asian um, OEMs that are using the boards. So um, being that it's been around now for about five years, it's um, getting more and more um, common. And like I said, the uh, um, you could either go to Altium or like I said, Joe Dixon, the real expert. He lives in Livermore, California. Um, yeah, well, choosing and venting a board fab is really, really important again to HDI. And um, um, I like to see um, these CAT reports or the PCQR squared report, which um, uh, gives you a 99% confidence of only a 3% error in their capability. And so unlike buying five boards, uh, to do one of these uh, benchmarking reports, which is what we use at Nanya, um, yeah, they cost a little bit more, but uh, you get a statistically significant uh, view of what their capability is. And typically military and other people that use this run the requalification every six months. We only do the requalification every year because we've got the coupons on every one of our assembly runners that relate back to the actual qualification runs. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of have a 100% visibility, but it's really important that, that they have a, a test vehicle and can document their research and their process controls um, because you are not going to be able to inspect or cross-section incoming micro boards. And as we move down to Ultra HDI, it's even tougher uh, visually and things like that to check them. You, you need to have electrical data that's statistically significant um, because of IPC warning. Well, I helped write that IPC warning. And... Um, um, the, the new spec um, is the control so that you don't get any of these suspicious boards into your thing. But we're still working on the root cause of why we're getting this. And it's getting quite complex in the crystallography of copper and electrolytic coppers and, and things like that. But um, I have an IPC group working on that. It has a lot to do with the z-axis of the materials you've selected. And so uh, um, that's one reason why the IPC said, well, you can kind of reliably go with two stack BS, but you should stagger the third. Um, there's excellent papers from the European Space Agency from 2023 APEX and 2022, where working with um, the IPC committee um, they were um, using a high performance uh, material because the, the space agency uses all poly um, laminate and uh, the Americans want this on the, the higher performance FR4 uh, materials. And so if you look at those papers, you'll see the test vehicles and the test reports and the design ones, as well as Lockheed Martin working a lot of this has some design reports.
working on them. Not quite sure what David has on uh, Tim. Like, what is an EQ? Uh, is that a question with requests for deviation? Um, David, if you want, you can unmute yourself and you can ask uh, your question. Yeah, how are you, Happy? Oh, hi. Hey, uh, we met at uh, Altium uh, 2019. Pleasure to be in your presence. Uh, no, we, we uh, design at these micro levels with miniaturization for medical devices. And um, when we go out and send our, our, our boards to CMs, they come back with questions like uh, engineering questions, that's the EQ. Um, and they're always looking to deviate from the spec and we're meeting the the four we're meeting the aspect ratios for class two and three, uh, but for at at the aspect ratios of uh, 0.75 to one, uh, but it always seems like uh, the the feedback is uh, pushing us away from the spec. Really? So my question, yeah, well, you know. I mean, not always, but it, you know these boards are really thin, um, and so there's there's a there's a there's an issue with with the bow and twisting and so forth. Well, that yeah, the uh, uh, one of the things about when we first got into HDI was the problem with flatness, and bow and twisting, which we we solved through annealing. Uh, but it, the I don't see anything unusual about your uh, you know the the geometries you're talking about um, this is the the technology um, that we had 40 years ago and that um, and certainly 20 years ago um, there this should be relatively easy I mean if you say you are pushing an aspect ratio of one to one or greater than one yeah um, or if you said well we want one or two mil microvias um, with with you know with only two mil annular rings, then yeah, it may require some deviation. But these are pretty straightforward, simple stuff that was easy to do twenty years ago. Um, the big question is, how do they uh, uh, like say what test vehicle do they use? You know what kind of statistical methodology are they using? Yeah, do they even have a process for process improvement in which um, um, which which you have to have when you get into HDI, um, you can't you know uh, slam bang it away. You're getting into like semiconductor geometries of fifty years ago. Yeah, and like semiconductor stuff. You need this statistical handbook, and you need engineering statistics, and statistically significant. Working with Nanya, um, when Intel came to Nanya to make the flip chip substrates for the Pentium, um, Intel purchased twenty thousand test vehicles over a two-year period because um, they realized that the fabricator, you know, is going to have problems like I've showed you from ninety-nine to two thousand four. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, so they paid for these test vehicles and, it, you know, because they had a problem solving methodology and scientific method, which is outlined in that free skills book. Um, and like any good scientific organization, you, you look at your mistake, like look at SpaceX, you look at your failures, you do a failure analysis and the next test vehicle is better. Um, and so, the semiconductor guy said never had a problem with this via stack vias opening up, never. And that's because there's only six of them in the world and 
they were all utilizing semiconductor statistical techniques and things like that in test vehicles. Um, and they eliminated the causes. And um, like, Nanya won't tell me what the root cause is. I said, well, there's only six of us that really thoroughly figured it out. And yeah. uh, we're going to leave it up to you to have your vendors figure it out. But um, it's got something to do with electrolytic copper crystal. Um, crystalline structures um, and um, and through process evolution, it can be eliminated uh, because these guys in semiconductors are stacking eight and 10 high now. Yes, they are, yeah. Uh, w without a problem at all, but they're also making mucho high volumes, you know, 10 million a month, million a month. I mean, they're not making 10 a month and things like that. And that's the dilemma is that You've got to figure out, you know, how to get a, a couple of your engineers and technicians trained enough to, in order to do a thorough R and D along the semiconductor avenue of approaches. Yeah, their sample um, size is, is large enough to get enough feedback to know uh, where they're having issues and problems. And, and that's why I, I threw in the pictures of the test vehicles. Uh, like I say, in Foxconn, we took the eight, eight HP test vehicles and moved it up to 24 test vehicles like that. Um, and a, a lot of the test vehicles for the bare board, um, once they pass the bare board, they become assembly test vehicles. Actually, we put parts on them, dummy parts, yeah. and then run them through uh, assembly and life testing things. So um, the thing of having good test vehicles and, um, and a good uh, process problem solving methodology which again um, is outlined in the in the free books um, as well as several articles I just did an article on sensor technology of, about coupons and um, especially for the ultra HDI folks that, that's an absolute necessity you know they so, will not get any kind of yield if, if they don't have that perfected there there are indeed methodologies. So regarding the Boeing twisting, uh, especially on uh, you know, like half a millimeter and under, we've been using um, wherever I have uh, some guard banding, or not guard banding, I'm sorry, wherever I have Faraday cages, I kind of fill them with non-conductive epoxies, act like columns, sort of become sort of board stiffener as much as possible. That right, pretty good process. Well, you, you know, uh, we found a lot of it had to do with with um, fillers and adders that the laminate makers have put in, uh -huh. and uh, and experimenting with annealing after manufacturing to get them flat. But um, you're going to see a lot about this on this chips act as we move into chiplets and bigger bigger substrates for bare chip attachment as part of the chip act um bow and twist um for assembly is going to be uh, a big issue and they're going to have to uh, since they're publicly funded you know talk a, a lot about formulations of material and or um, um ways about it now one of the beauties we had in that first hci board being a copper core a slab of copper and teflon being highly thermoplastic, like, you know, we didn't have anything. Of course, we were also wire bonding, which uh, can compensate for that. But um, um, I, I think that uh, the CHIPS Act is going to make a lot of the solutions public because of the funding coming out of the, the government with that. Um, and, and what they'll be doing is is opening up the box of what the Asians have kept secret for the last 20 years through their extensive use of supplying the IC substrates for for all of us. Um, you know, as they move to larger and larger substrates and finer and finer geometries, you know, they encounter these problems and have to solve them uh, like before. Yes, sir. Well, I've taken up enough of your time.